All right, so yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me in Manila. Um, thanks, Thomas and Rico, for organizing this. Um, my name's Brian. Uh, as you said, I'm a, a creative developer. Uh, I work with a company called Happy Act. We do interactive video uh, back in the States I'm from New York. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about my project, uh, Seriously JS, today. Um, first, a uh, little bit of context. Um, I want to talk about uh, what it is that we really kind of love about the web first, right? Um, first thing I think is it's interactive. Um, it kind of, you know, responds to you both in the kind of, you know, uh, responding to your mouse clicks and keyboard and touch like that, things like that. Um, it's, it's up to the minute, it's up to date. Uh, so, you know, if you go and look at a web page or a web app, that thing can be, you know, it's the latest thing. It's not like a book or a, or a movie frozen in time. Um, it's connected uh, uh, originally through servers and now with, with WebRTC to, to peers. Um, so you can kind of communicate with it. Um, and the other thing, one of my favorite things about it is its view source, is that you can kind of take it apart. Uh, it's not this kind of locked black box. You can go in and you know, see what other people did and you know, look at the source of a web page and copy it and paste it. And it's a great way, to, it really encourages um, remix and mashups and learning, and I think it's why uh, you know you can. It's not this kind of uh, esoteric, impossible to understand thing that you need to go be an apprentice somewhere to learn it. You can really pull it apart yourself and learn it. Um, and it's great in certain media. Um, the web started out with text uh, and hypertext, so it's it's kind of mature in that sense, and it's great at it. Um, along came layout with CSS. Uh, and, and, then, and then still images, right? So it's pretty good at presenting still images and we have 2D canvas for modifying those images and creating some images on the fly. And now video and audio, but until very recently, the last couple of years, video's kind of been a second class citizen on the web. Uh, it's been sort of a black box, you know, when, when video was in, in Flash or, or even before that in like QuickTime embed objects, uh, for those of you who've been around a little longer, um, it's a, you know, it's sort of like you, you couldn't really affect it. You could just kind of embed it on the web, and the web was really just a delivery platform for something that was kind of less than TV. Um, but now, uh, you know, I'm going to show you, there's, a, I think, a lot more we can do with it. You know, now that there's the HTML video element, um, we can embed it as part of the page and apply CSS transitions to it as well. Um, but now, with Canvas and with WebGL, we can have access to the actual pixels and really mess with it and kind of explore it and, and push it to some new limits. Um, so what's so great about video in the first place, right? So video is um, visually expressive, um, a little bit unlike this slide here. Um, and it expresses stories, ideas, and emotions through moving images and sound, right? And it does that through, um, you know, with music and dialogue, with text, hopefully not so much text, um, with quote-unquote real images, uh, and then kind of simulated images through whether it's trick photography or, or CGI or, or, you know, whatever else, right? So what if, though, we could take those great things about video and those great things about the web and kind of bring them together, right? Because all those things before I said that were so great about the web, video traditionally has none of that, right? It's not really interactive. Um, it's, it's not up to date, you know, if you buy a DVD, like that DVD is that DVD until you lose it or throw it away or it becomes obsolete and you can't play it anymore. Um, it's not really connected, it's kind of an isolated experience um, and it certainly doesn't really have much in the way of view source. You know, if you want to mash something up, you, you don't really, you know, there's a lot you can do with video mashups, but you don't, you don't really get like the project files, right? But, you know, with, if we combine it with the web, maybe we can get all of that out of both. So, that brings us to Seriously.js, right? Which is a real-time, um, node-based video effects compositor for the web with HTML5, JavaScript, and WebGL, right? So, video effects compositing is kind of the, uh, kind of the key words here. So, what is that, right? Now, uh, originally, sort of in the beginning of kind of computers being involved in film, we had quote-unquote CGI, which is like your basic 3D graphics. And then that started out, I think the first film that, that used it was uh, 
Star Trek II and like a visualization of the Genesis project. And, you know, and it got us movies like Tron and Lawnmower Man, real cinema classics, you know? Um, and then, you know, those Pixar guys, I guess they did some stuff that was okay. Um, you know, but, but that was kind of... It, for a long time, it was just like, you know, like, like Tron and, and, and Lawnmower Man, it's, you, you have these movies that are about the computer graphics, right? And it was only later that we started to see um, where the, the computer-generated stuff would mix with the live-action video. And that's, that's from video compositing, right? So this is a, a sample from, from Life of Pi, right? Uh, which is supposed to be it's fantastical, but it's not about computer graphics. There's no point where you're watching the movie where you're gonna go, oh yeah, that's, that's a computer, I get it. You know, I see the polygons, right? You're really trying to hide all that. Um, and they, you know, they shot that whole, most of that movie in a studio with a swimming pool and a big blue screen. And, you know, the compositing was where they, they put in the background and they put in the rain and they put in the weather and the fog and they, they affect the color, um, you know, and you can really, uh, kind of see the difference there. Um, so Seriously JS is an effort to see if we can do some of that in a web browser, right? Now, it's inspired by some software that uh, is traditionally used for, for static compositing, right? So this is, this is After Effects, uh, it was made by Adobe. Uh, a lot of people use that. Um, I guess this is a, a scene from Iron Man. Um, also, Nuke is a really great one um, that's used in a lot of professional films. For, for, the, for like Hollywood films for this kind of compositing. Um, Nuke is also a, a, a node-based compositor, like seriously, so it's inspired by that. Uh, and I'll explain a little more, more about what I mean by nodes. Um, so first, Seriously.js includes a number of video effects that you can just apply to a video, and you can do it in real time, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna demo for you guys in a little bit. Um, so it includes color effects, which is just kind of straight up kind of tweaking the color. It's kind of like Instagram, right? Um, and there's a range of those. Um, things like blur, which is, you know, a little more, rather than just tweak the individual color of the pixels, it kind of affects the pixels to the left and the right. Um, keying, like chroma key and luma key, that's like blue screen, green screen. Um, that's pretty powerful, pretty cool. And then just kind of various kind of stylizing things. Um, and a bunch more, right? We also provide uh, kind of some, some transforms where you can you can scale a video and you can move it around and skew it and stretch it in all kinds of dimensions. Um, that's going to become pretty cool. A lot of that stuff you can do in CSS, but when you combine it with the effects, it's, it's more powerful. Um, so before I show you some demos, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the motivation behind the technology and why this WebGL stuff is so transformative, right? So WebGL, right, usually you think WebGL is like, you know, 3D, right? And that's kind of the kind of base case for it, you know, 3JS is great, and you know, you see all these demos with flying squares and fish and stuff like that. Um, but WebGL really, it's actually just a 2D API. Uh, it's really designed for drawing triangles on the screen, and you kind of transform those triangles, right? With, so we just kind of use that, we just draw two triangles in the shape of a rectangle, one big rectangle that fills the whole screen, right? And we just kind of use the video as a, as a texture, on that triangle, because you can upload textures to the GPU and render those on your triangles, right? And we use um, this kind of a perspective transform, so which is you know what what WebGL and, and OpenGL usually use to get a 3D effect. Uh, we can use that to just kind of you know move things around, like I was talking about with the the different transforms. And then we write a shader, uh, which if you don't know, a shader is a a small program that gets uploaded into your GPU and runs at each sort of vertex of your polygon or at each pixel. And it gets the input color and, it process and some other information and it spits out a new color, right? Now why not 2D Canvas, right? We've had 2D Canvas around for a while. Um, it can access images and the video. Um, it's a lot more widely available than uh, WebGL and it's a lot more, um, it's much, much easier to use. Like writing shaders is actually really hard. Um, now, so here's an example. So, so back when, when the 2D canvas first kind of came around with like, you know, the beginning of HTML5 and you could access video with it, uh, there was some examples of somebody doing like chroma keying uh, or, you know, kind of a green screen effect. Um, so here's some code that I, I kind of grabbed from, from that. Um, I'm just going to kind of highlight it, right, and point out the kind of key components, right? 
So just kind of the, the way the, the browser gives you access to the video pixels, the first thing you have to do is you have to you take your video element, right, which is this kind of video variable here, and you draw it to your graphics, your 2D context, right? Because you can't directly access the, um, the video pixels from the video, but you can access the pixels from the canvas. So first you have to draw it to a canvas, then you get the pixels from the canvas, right? Then you go through the pixel, the pixel data, you process it one pixel at a time, and you, you check there's like a distance function here that tells you whether or not, you know, it's the color matches, and then you set the alpha channel to zero, right? Because you get your red, blue, green, blue, and alpha, and alpha is your transparency channel. Um, and then you put the image back into, once you've processed it, you display the image by putting that array back into the, um, uh, into the display canvas. And this is originally when I decided I wanted to do these comp compositing effects, this is what I did. But it didn't work, and the reason is, uh, there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is what we're doing here is we're doing a copy, a copy and an allocate, process one pixel at a time in the CPU with tons of these memory accesses that are a little bit slow, and then a third copy, right? Because the thing is that when you, when you copy, when you get the image data from your canvas, it doesn't let you get the image data into an existing array. It makes a new array. So if you were to have a, a high-definition video, right, that's 1280 pixels by 720 pixels, by, and then four bytes per pixel, because you red, green, blue, and, and alpha, you know, you're looking at about three and a half megabytes, right? So that's three and a half megabytes copied three times, plus allocated, and then garbage collected 30 times a second, right? And that'll slow you down. Plus, and that's not even with the processing, and this is just one effect, right? So we tried it, it didn't really work. We were getting really slow frame rates. Um, you can see there's a couple of demos out there that do it with these tiny little postage stamp size videos that kind of remind me of the old CD-ROM days in the 90s, but, you know, I'm pretty old, so. Um, anyway, so we do it in WebGL. So WebGL is much, much faster. It processes things in parallel. Um, there's, a, there's kind of fewer of the video copies and the allocations. Um, and once you've got your data on the GPU, access to it within the GPU is very, very, very fast. And it processes, depends on what kind of hardware you have, but it processes many pixels all at the same time, right? So now how about this node thing, right? So I talked about nodes. It has nothing to do with Node.js. It's just a coincidence uh, that it's called that. Um, but the way it works is kind of we have uh, three or four different kinds of nodes, right? You start out with your source node, which that accesses your image source, right? So that can be a video, it can be an image, it can be a canvas, really anything you want, right? And you can make a number of those, right? Uh, you can even actually access um, a pixel array if you have that, or a existing WebGL texture if you want to bring it in from something like 3.js. Um, and then you've got an effect node, right? Or one or more effect nodes, and you can chain the effect nodes, which takes, so each, each of these arrows kind of uh, represents the image data transitioning from one node to the next, right? Um, kind of like an assembly line. Uh, or if you've ever used like, uh, like audio video equivalent, like, like each one of those is kind of like a cable, right? Where each box does something to your signal and then passes it along. Uh, it's not unlike the, the data flow stuff that Simon was talking about yesterday. Um, so then the effect node processes it, and the output is the result to a target node, which is your canvas. Um, and and the, the kind of the JavaScript uh, kind of infrastructure of Seriously.js is designed to, it kind of has sort of a, a a push and pull model where um, it's smart enough not to render things that it doesn't need, right? So um, if you start with a static image and, or, a, or a video and the video is paused, right, it doesn't need to update that. But if you tweak the knobs on one of the effects, it needs to update that. So it kind of, every time you get an update, it sort of um, pushes forward into the network, into the network of nodes, and marks everything as dirty. And then it goes to the end, to the target node, the output node, and it tracks back, rendering each one as it goes along. So it all, it's really smart. If you, if you ever run one of the um, demos, you see that the, you know, if it's ever still, the frame rate is very high, and the CPU usage is very low, uh, and it only kind of bumps up again once you start playing or modifying it. Um, you can also uh, have, like, an example of the split nodes. So you can have uh, multiple sources. And that's, this is where it really becomes compositing. Um, so whether a split or a, or a blend, so it does like, for example, all of the Photoshop blend modes, you can layer one mode on top of another and you can have opacity and, um, you know, alpha channels and all that cool stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, 
There's also uh, transform nodes, which are cool, which is for moving things around. Um, you can basically uh, do a, what's called a perspective transform. transform. So uh, as long as it's kind of a uniform, you've got your, you're preserving your, your rectangle in 3D space, um, you can do whatever you want. It, you can't really bend it. That would require an effect node. Um, but that's really cool for like moving things around. So uh, you know, yesterday, uh, Leo was showing some of the, the stuff with CSS, uh, you know, where you have this kind of face that wants to move around in a circle, and you can, you can kind of um, composite multiple transforms on another, on one another. And, and the way that works, it's actually really efficient, is that it combines them all into one. So when you get the output of your effect node, um, the transform node, all it really is, is, is a very simple four by four matrix multiplication, which you can do in JavaScript, and it's super fast, and it doesn't actually process the image. And it changes those, it cha um, chains those all into one sort of little, squeezes into one computation, and then puts that, sends that, um, trans that matrix transform, that four by four matrix, into the target node, which then uses that in the shader and calculates the output. It's a bit technical, um, but it, it ends up being pretty fast. Um, so now, what's the API like? like? How do we use this, right? So um, seriously, JS is kind of uh, somewhat, I don't want to say unique, but um, I wanted to, it was important to me to target the audience when designing the API, right? Um, and really, you kind of have two audiences, right? You have your plugin developers who are going to actually build the effects and want to get in under the hood of seriously. And then you have your kind of the people who are going to use the API. And I really wanted to make this available to people who don't necessarily have a really long programming background. Um, you know, people who access like, um, you know, who learn through Code Academy or just little, little bits of tinkering. I want to make that easy for them. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, frame rates are really important. So um, we prioritize, gen just generally when, we're, when I'm coding, I prioritize performance when you're in a loop, you know, in, in kind of hot code that needs to be, you know, within less than 16 milliseconds. Um, but not really, you know, sacrificing the usability or the readability of the code. Um, you know, and, and also knowing that the, we want to make this available for kind of novice developers. We really we want to shield them from any properties or methods that, that might break. You know, I, I think a, a programmer has a responsibility to its users, whether the users are, you know, through a graphical interface or a touch interface, or the users are people using your library say, you know, I don't, it's not up to me to say, oh, you need to figure it out, and if you break it, it's your fault. Like, if I can recover from a mistake, then great, I'm going to do so. So, you know, artists and, and authors as, as the, you know, as one target audience, you know, like I said, assume a code academy, you know, level of, of programming skill. Um, and, you know, video compositing and, and being a video artist is hard enough. Like, that's plenty hard. Um, and my demos are, they're just demos. They're not great stories. Um, so, I, you know, I respect that, that skill, and that skill should be the bottleneck. I think if, you know, if an artist comes to use this, the hardest thing they're doing is, is the art, not, not the programming, right? Um, so we do lots of input validation. Um, you know, if you're going to give me a set of color as a parameter on something, right? Like, you can give me the name of the color, you can give me a string that's red, you can give me an array of, you know, RGB values, you can give me a CSS, you know, a, a hex color or a RGB function, you know, we'll handle it all, right? And if you give me, if the numbers are out of the, you know, out of the range, that's okay, we'll cap it. Like, we work for you. So, you know, there's polymorphism, um, which tends, to, you know, it can be a little bit slower, um, but it's, it's worth it, uh, and it's not enough to make a difference in the frame rate here. Um, and, you know, recovering from bad input. So if you give me something that's ugly, um, I'm going to try my best not to crash and just give you something, right? Now, on the other hand, there's the plugin developers. Like I said, building shaders is really hard, right? So I assume a much higher level of programming skill. So here we can kind of prioritize low-level access and efficiency and speed and performance, you know? So it, it's, it enables you to kind of um, cover both audiences and protect them both. And I just think it's important to, to kind of know your audience in that way and serve them in that way. Um, so what's it look like? How do we use it? So like I said, try to keep the API pretty simple. So we start with creating a source node. I'm not going to go over too much code here. Um, so we create the first thing is we create a new seriously instance, and that's your composition. Um, you can access a video element just like you ac excuse me, access any video element. And you create a source node by calling seriously.source. 
that's it, you've got your source node. Pretty simple. Um, an effect node, very symbol, similar, right? You just, we've already got our source node, right? You create blur equals seriously dot effect direction blur. So you've got a string lookup of all the different effects in the library. Um, and then you just kind of tweak the values by, by just setting them on the object. Uh, so those are setters and getters and, um, you know, they validate. So, you know, if you say blur dot amount and blur needs to be between zero and one and you give me, you know, one and a half, it just becomes one. Um, it, we try to be, you know, intelligent here and make it easy. Um, what else? Target node, right? So target, you always, almost always want to output to a canvas. Um, you can output to a, a byte array or a pixel, you know, a pixel array or to um, an existing uh, a WebGL texture. But for the most part, you output directly to a canvas. Um, you create a canvas, set your eye, put it in the, uh, in the DOM and just create your target on the canvas. Um, and the next step is to string them all together, right? Because you want to create that node graph. So you just kind of connect your nodes by saying blur.source is your source, uh, target.source is your blur, um, and then go. So go is pretty good. So we, so we have a couple of options here for how you actually render. Um, so if you want to take any given target node or the whole composition, you could just call target.render. Right? So if you have a game loop, for example, and you want to do other stuff in your game loop, and you want to use SeriouslyJS as kind of the post-processing pass on your game, right? you, you're going to want to run your own draw loop, and you can call it uh, target.render. Uh, or you can just say go, and what go does, go is great, because it, then it monitors all of your sources, all of your, you know, whether it's your videos and images as they get connected and disconnected, or as they play, and all of your, your inputs. So back when I said, um, like, you know, blur.amount is 0 0.8. If you want to animate the blur, all you got to do is you change it to 0 0.7 or something else, and once you've used Go, it'll automatically redraw. But it will not redraw while that stuff is not changing, just to be uh, efficient. Um, so we could, there's also kind of an easier way. Like I said, polymorphism is really important here. Um, so this is an example where we create all our elements in, uh, in HTML in the DOM. Um, and we can wire it up. We can get, I'm going to hide, I'm going to highlight the code here. Um, so instead of actually creating a source node, we can create our, our chroma key node, right? So this is a chroma key example. Um, and just set source is the string is the ID of the video. Um, and what also is really cool, so split is our effect node, which, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, and you can just link that up to an actual input element, and it will watch the input element for you. So it's really fast to create interfaces on these things. Um, I think like a, uh, if you were creating a, a, a final production of a, of a piece, you'd probably build your own interfaces or you'd have things on, you know, uh, animate over time and, and interact to other things. But a lot of times for experimenting, you just want to, you know, wire that up to a, a, a range slider and go, right? So that's pretty cool. That works pretty well. So here's what that looks like, right? So. Here we got our video of a dog, right? And uh, I created two, so we split the input of our dog video to two different um, nodes. One which is the chroma key node, right? And then one is straight into the split, right? So right now the split is set at zero, so we can just kind of move. I don't know why my dog's not playing. Whoa, that's not good. There you go. There you go. So we can just kind of drag our split effect, and it's got an angle parameter on it, right? And then we can, we can make the edge fuzzy if we want to, um, and just kind of drag that around. Um, so that's, it's, a, it's pretty easy if you just kind of want to play with the effects and, and see what works. And it wasn't really very much code. Um, and the dog just kind of loops and plays, and, you know, and he's fine. He's very happy. So OK, let's move back over here. All right, so uh, a couple of tips, just to, some things to be aware of um, if you're using this. Um, first thing is uh, pre-process what you can. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of these processing, and you'll, you'll see some more options of what you can do. There's a lot of color effects and things like that. Um, you know, if you have a color effect that's the same on every video, so every time you watch it, if it's the same, there's no reason to process that color effect in the person, in everybody's browser. If you can call, you know, process that color effect in, you know, in the actual video and burn it into the video, then great, do that. You'll save some CPU cycles. Um, 
And you, know, and you might even, depending on what the effect is, you might even get a better output. Um, next thing is, don't forget about uh, cross-origin restrictions. Um, videos need to be, uh, just for security reasons, videos and um, images, they need to be in this, either the same origin or they need to have cores headers on it. It's a little bit of a pain in the neck, but you can do it. So unfortunately, you can't just grab any video out there on the internet and you know, process it. You usually have to have your own server or you know, server of somebody you know is going to give you access with those headers. It's a little bit of a pain in the neck, uh, but something to be aware of. Um, yeah, and generally want to keep videos. I find that 960 by 540 is about the right size, for the right upper limit for videos. Um, so this is, a, this is a MacBook Air. It's two years old. It's got four gigs of RAM. It's not anywhere near, like, it's not a super fast computer these days. And, you know, we're running these effects at pretty high frame rates. But um, the slowest thing, that the bottleneck tends to be the upload of the video frame from the video element into the GPU. Um, and once you get above 960 by 540, 960 by 540, you can get your 60 frames per second. But past that, it starts to slow things down a little bit. So, just something to keep aware, be aware of. But if you're doing still images, or if, you know, then feel free to go much bigger. Um, if you're using, if you know that it's going to be, if you're setting up like a kiosk or something, and you know that it's going to be a really fast computer, you can go higher. Um, and that's, that has actually nothing to do with the file size, because um, the file size can be compressed. So once you're, you know, if you have, if you have compression on your video, once you're copying that from the GPU, you know, fr from the video to the GPU, that's already uncompressed. So your compression rate makes a difference for um, the network transfer, like it would on any web page. But uh, here, the size is more important in the pixels. OK, so moving on. It's time for some demos, right? Let's get to the good stuff. OK. Um, all right, so I need to give myself camera access. Hang on. Thank you. All right, so all this stuff works great with Get User Media. Hang on. There we go. OK. How are we doing? All right. So one thing we can do is I showed you that split effect before, right? We do ourselves a good old Star Wars wipe effect, right, to the fish. Why is the fish video not playing? I don't know. That fish video is supposed to be playing, but imagine it's playing. Um, and, you know, that's, that works back and forth. It's a very simple little effect you can do. It just kind of replicates some of the stuff we've seen in the cinema. Uh, here's another one. Oh, this is fun. This is an ASCII text effect. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, and that works on the fish, too. Oh, now the fish are moving. There you go. All right. So ASCII fishes, very important. OK. What else we got? Uh, chroma key. This is fun. So this is, um, this is a blue screen effect I was telling you about. I happen to have behind me a great big blue screen. And yeah, so that works. So that's pretty good. So that works for blue screen, green screen. Um, and it was, like, the code for this is super short. Like, I set up the chroma key node, like I showed you before, and all I have to do is set the color from green to blue. Um, and it's a pretty good effect. It's, um, the, some of the, the demos that you'll see out there for um, the 2D canvas, they do kind of this distance model where they say, all right, I've, you know, as long as my color is within a certain range of my target color, we'll key it out. Um, but this uses a little bit more of a complicated model involving the saturation. Uh, of, the, of the pixels, so it's looking for high saturation. And so it can even do things like, it can detect things like glass that's semi-transparent. So if I, if I had some, you know, um, there's, I have another video where there's a guy blowing bubbles in front of a green screen, and you can kind of see the bubbles, and it extracts the green, so it's pretty cool, and shadows and stuff. So that's pretty good. Definitely play with that. That's a big one for compositing. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, TV glitch effect. This is one of my favorites. Um, and we do a little channel change. Hang on. There you go. So hop the TV glitch effect. Um, this one, this is my favorite. TV glitch, I think, is going to be the page curl of the 21st century, right? So I, guys, I want you all to go out there and throw TV glitch effect at everything. And it's great because we don't really have TVs like this anymore. And I love how in movies they always have analog you know, TV glitch on digital signals. So go do lots of that. That's good. Explore it. Play with it. Um, what else? Uh, okay, so this is, this is not actually an effect, but this is a thing, this is a trend if you've seen this movie. This is a, um, a still from um, uh, Transformers 7 or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and they do this thing now where they make all these movies. Um, they did it in, um, 
They did it in uh, this hot tub time machine. They did it. it great movie. They did it in Iron Man 2. I don't have a picture of that. But you, you notice these guys, everything is either blue or orange. Um, so they do uh, this kind of digital color timing. Um, the digital color correction actually is interesting, a little bit of history. That started with, um, I think it was Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? was the first movie where they, they really just scanned in the whole film into a computer and they digitally color corrected it. And now everything is digitally color corrected. And now they're making everything to be blue and orange and it's ridiculous and it's terrible. Um, and, you know, you can do that too. So now I'm gonna, I'll show you what it looks like. I'll turn it on and off. Um, so there's my skin, it's all kind of orange, and the toggle it, so that's it off. It's a subtle effect here, it works with the fish too, right? So that's what the fish are supposed to look like. And here we got, we make the orange pop. So um, if you want to explore that cliche also, please go do that. Maybe it could probably use some TV glitch, but I didn't have time for that. Okay, what else? Uh, oh yeah, this is a fun one, okay. This one is, so this is an, um, an interactive video experiment I played with. This is a music video. I can't, oh, hang on, I have to do that here. I have to click the play button. Okay. So this is a video by the band OK Go. Um, so this I use for uh, color replacement. So OK Go is great. Uh, if you go to seriouslyjs.org, I have another demo from OK Go that I did. They're great. Uh, they, they did the, um, the vi video of the guys on the treadmills, if you, if you don't know who they are. Um, and they're, they're just great to work with because they make these really colorful videos and they put it out there for you to mess with. So this is this kind of, here, let me go back a little bit, this colorful video. So I built this thing where the more you move the mouse, it just kind of changes the color. Um, and it's got a great little filter on it based on kind of a range of hue and saturation. So it changes, it, it excludes the skin tone. Um, and kind of the ground and stuff. Um, and it only filters out the wall. Uh, so I built this little demo where uh, you have to keep moving the mouse, and the more you move the mouse, the more it changes the color. But if you stop moving the mouse, you don't touch it, it kind of fades out to gray. Uh, so this is kind of a, a little experiment. And, and uh, each scene, as they change, each scene has uh, a different kind, of, different kind of settings on it. So I use popcorn.js to create each scene and change the settings on the hue saturation node. Um, so that's pretty cool, so I like that. Uh, so what else? Yeah, that one, that was some of these scenes that didn't work, this one's really hard because they're wearing green and the stuff behind them is green, so I couldn't figure that one out. So what else? Okay. Uh, this is another one, fun, fun one. This is, so this is just to show up one of the, the effects in, in the library is called, uh, it's a repeat effect. So you just, you give it, um, what you do is you give it a transform node that doesn't actually have an input, right? You give it a video input, and you give it a transform node, and you give it a number, right? And it takes that transform node and it repeatedly runs the transform on every new instance. So, you know, I've got uh, a whole lot of Neil deGrasse Tysons here. Um, I don't know what would happen if you tried to make each, you could do these transforms in CSS. I, suppose, I imagine that if you tried to do it and you had like, what is it, like 25, video elements and tried to play them all at once and keep them all in sync, I imagine you might run into trouble. So this is it's a cool thing you can do with Seriously. Uh, also, just um, if you notice, if you look really carefully at the bottom or at the top when their heads overlap each other, um, I've got a, Luma key, a luminance key effect running on this. Uh, luminance key is like green screen, but it uses, if you have a bright white background, it keys that. So sometimes it's easier to find a bright white background than it is to find a perfectly lit green background. Um, so we get a little transparency. Uh, just a side note, um, while you have stuff like PNG, uh, which is an image format that has an alpha channel in it, there is no video format that is available on the web that can have an alpha channel. So if you ever want to have an alpha channel on video, uh, you got to either use, um, use a, a key like this, or you can, we have another, uh, there's another plugin that's a channel mapping plugin. So you could use another video as the alpha channel, um, but I don't have a demo of that. Okay, so what else? Uh, oh yeah, all right. So this is, I'm showing off the blur. Um, this is something I'm gonna try, this is not gonna work. So I have a blur plugin, which I just got working, which is, um, so you'll notice this is a really large blur, right? Um, a lot of the, pl the blurs you'll see in, in WebGL, you kind of get like a few pixels here and there, and it's really hard to get a high radius blur. Um, this one works by successively um, blurring and blurring and blurring, and it scales down the, the textures. Um, 
So it's actually the, the more you blur it, the faster it is, which is weird. Um, I'm going to try this. This is not going to work. Hang on. But let's see. Let's see. Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. 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 Okay. Um, so. <laughs> so this is it. So you, you notice the blur animates, which is really cool. And we use the scaling uh, transform node. I want to apologize to Andy. Um, so Andy, you guys are all here, but for the video, I couldn't get this to work yesterday. The trick, Andy, is to get it to respond to any words you say. Um, <laughs> So try that next time. Uh, where's my thing? I can't believe that word. All right. Uh, OK, this one's cool. Uh, so this is called a displacement map. So if you've ever seen um, when they take a, like a, uh, when they shoot a movie in 2D and they convert it to 3D, like when, you know, 3D movies are huge right now. And when you go to, um, you know, they don't all shoot them in 3D with two cameras. A lot of them, they shoot them in 2D and they convert it, which is this, miserable painful uh, process, but they use this thing called this displacement map. Um, so this is, a, I got a copy of this displacement map from somebody on the internet, I didn't make it, um, but check this out, what you can do with it, this is kind of crazy. Where? Come on. Yeah, so we got like a little subtle head movement from Emma there. Um, how creepy is that? Uh, I'm, I'm sure she would think so if she saw it. Um, but I actually, I was, I was thinking that if I had, I didn't have time, but I wanted to wire this up to the web audio API with a beat detector and have her doing like, you know, little one of these. Um, so next year, next year. Um, so this is, I'll just show you, this is what the displacement map looks like. Uh, so the brighter the value, the more it um, displaces the pixels to the left or the right, or up or down. Um, so some, somebody uh, on YouTube, there's a link to this tutorial there, if you can, you probably can't see it, but um, like just, paints this by hand based on their, his estimation. Um, I tried to do it, but it didn't really come out very well, so I borrowed his. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, what else? Um, oh, I have another example I didn't get to show you, but you can, if you can find a video that is like a very still scene, you could use that to kind of do this in a video as well and, and like kind of change angles in a video. Or, you know, if you wanted to have, you know, you could get Emma from, two different sides if you had like a 3D screen, which I don't, unfortunately, next year. Uh, what else? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So somebody once said to me, if it doesn't work on mobile, it's not worth doing. All right. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, hang on. Can I, let's see, can you guys, you guys zoom in? I need to come closer. All right. That's all right. I brought my own. Hang on. See if this works. Camera. Uh, okay, can you see that? So this is a TV glitch effect running. So this is Firefox uh, on Android. Um, I'll get a little bit more in a second about like what platforms this works on. But um, Firefox is pretty cool because it lets you. Um, hang on. Oh, uh, it's creepy. It's haunted. Right. So if you smack it, like like an old TV, <laughs> um, it responds. Um, and the, the creepy face is interesting because it has a, um, there you go, uh, it has the, um, a light detector in the phone. So Firefox Mobile is really awesome. It gives you access to the accelerometer and the, the, the brightness detector. And so the, the theory is with this little toy, like if, you, if you're watching it and your lights are on, it's just an old TV and you've got to smack it every so often. But when the lights go off, it, it goes crazy and it has that scary face coming in and out. So that's kind of neat. Um, all right, so I, I gotta, I gotta hurry up here. Let's see what else we got. Okay, what else? Uh, all right, so there's a couple of challenges uh, in dealing with this stuff, especially compared to traditional static compositing. I want to go over that. So WebGL is a pain in the butt. Um, why is that? Um, there are driver issues. So you know, sometimes if you have an old driver, these drivers it kind of doesn't really work very well, especially like on, on Linux. Sometimes when you have open source drive drivers that aren't really from the manufacturer and kind of things aren't always that good. And you get these like lost contacts things that happen. It's kind of hard. Um, old hardware, again, like obviously there's less and less of that as we go, but it can be, it can be a snag for WebGL. Um, 
Mobile, uh, yeah, also mobile devices are often slower, so sometimes you need to um, use like a, a lower res version of your video for a mobile device. Um, no DOM input, uh, that's also like, so you can use, um, like I said, canvas and images and video for your input textures, but unfortunately you can't use um, like actual chunks of the web page. Uh, there's a library called uh, HTML to Canvas, which is pretty good, um, but it's not really good for animating, so if you want to get like a one-off screenshot of your image and then mess with that, you can do that. Um, oh yeah, and uh, non-power of two texture limits. So WebGL re really likes all of your um, texture sizes to be powers of two. Um, most people just don't shoot video in power of two textures. Um, so it, there's some things you can't really do with scaling, like if you were to scale it up, it uses much smoother, prettier scaling if you have power of two textures. And, um, there may one day be uh, WebGL extensions for that, but for right now, it's just a minor pain in the neck. Um, platforms, what platforms is available on? So WebGL worked great on Firefox and Chrome. Those guys are awesome, right? And it just works like a, like a dream, right? Um, Safari technically has WebGL, but it's disabled by, the, by default and it's super slow for videos. So unfortunately, like it's not really realistic or viable for this stuff. Um, IE11 finally has WebGL, which is great, but it doesn't let you use video as a texture. So you could do basic image processing for the stuff in IE11. It does work, passes the unit tests, awesome, but for video, I'm afraid it's kind of useless. Um, mobile, Firefox and Chrome, again. iPad, not gonna happen. Um, as much as I would like them to do it, they don't seem to be having any interest in that. Um, but again, this is, this is, I consider this stuff is to be like pretty well out there. So, you know, I'm kind of engineering for the, not the lowest common denominator, but, but the highest. Um, video delivery, uh, compression artifacts. So if you're, um, uh, like if you, if you were working on a movie, right, like, like Iron Man or something like that, you would get the like raw, uncompressed straight from the camera video. Um, but, you know, when you're drawing green screen on something that's compressed with WebM or MP4, you get some artifacts. Um, it's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, like I said, texture upload to GPU is slow, so the size is limited. Um, there's a seeking delay, so there's not as, it's not as easy. You can modify the pixels. It's harder to modify the time if you want to slow things down and speed them up. That's, I haven't really figured out how to do that yet. Um, but hopefully um, VP9 and DALA in the next, I mean, it could be a few years. It's kind of out there, but will should be higher quality video formats, so maybe we can see some of those compression artifacts go away. Um, webcams suck. Uh, they just don't have good color fidelity, um, and they like to auto ex like adjust their exposure and white balance. So if you were to like have you know if you want to shoot something in front of a blue screen, it might go, oh your thing is tinted way too blue. Sorry, we're gonna we're gonna adjust it to white, and then it just screws everything up. Um, what else? Uh, unsupervised compositing, really quickly. Um, again, if you're you know, working on Iron Man 3 and you're tweaking stuff, you know, there's a lot of manual work that goes into that. Um, you know, they paint out wires and tracking markers. Um, you know, they, might, they might do a green screen, but like, this part in the corner needs to be painted over. Um, if you're running this stuff on a webcam and you don't know what that's going to look like on the other end, you, d you can't do that. Um, so you just, you just have to be aware of these things and work around it and realize that you know, it's a much more unpredictable scenario and it, it's in some ways a, a very different art. Um, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to kind of breeze out. What are, breeze through. what are we doing in the future? Um, more effects, make the, the API more mature. mature. I want to have different kinds of sources uh, as well as, as you know, the, the videos and the images. Um, chain you know is an interesting idea to make it faster, but I don't have time to talk about it. Um, Want to build a graphical interface? Uh, there's a guy working on that right now um, who did the, the no flow as a data flow project. Um, WebRTC, this could be interesting. Get user media, as you can see, works now. Um, recording does not work yet. There's a proposal for that. That should be great. Um, and and uh, eventually broadcasting Canvas appears. So I'd love to see this, you know, if, if you're going to make like a web video show, um, you know, you, you could do that and broadcast that out. Um, what else? Very lastly, I want to use this, um, I'm experimenting with some computer vision. Um, I'm going to skip this, I don't have time, but uh, there's some stuff you can do to, to actually analyze the image as in parallel in the GPU. It's really hard, but you can do some cool stuff with it. And this is just the beginning, the very first sample. Um, so this is a picture of a couple of guys are here. They took, it could probably use a little white balance correction. 
So let's run a little white balance on that. Um, so yeah, so we do an auto white balance, so we can actually analyze the entire color of the photo and find you know what's the color correction that needs to be done, um, and then just for fun, make them look like they're in transformers because you know they need that. Um, that's about it. What is all this for? Really quickly, um, it works great as a simple effect library, um, interactive cinema, kind of like that example I showed you with the OK Go video, um, where you know you're taking cinema and making it interactive. Um, Browser-based editor. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times offline tools are better for editing images and video, but sometimes it's just easier, you know, to, to, to build a browser-based editor, editor. It can be delivered over the web, um, you know, so that's something that may come in the future. Uh, somebody told me the other day they're, they're building a desktop video app with this, with Node WebKit. Um, oh, and accessibility, this is really awesome. A guy from the BBC who's in the R&D department, um, I don't have time to show it to you, but uh, made an effect that um, for people who are colorblind, um, it will process the color to make them stand out differently so the colorblind people can see that stuff, which is really cool. I'm really excited about that. That's pretty awesome. Um, finally, yeah, I think this stuff is for real. It's happening, but it needs a lot of work. Um, it's a little bit of a new art form, so go out there and experiment with it and you know, make lots of TV glitches and make stuff that sucks before it makes stuff that's good. Um, and please contribute. Uh, you know, I, need, I need patches. I need bug reports, um, lots of help, it's on GitHub, it's all free, um, check it out. Finally, you know, I think um, this will let us go from, you know, like I said, compositing is a big step up from CGI, it lets us go from crappy movies like Lawnmower Man and Tron to awesome movies like Lawnmower Man and Tron 2. Um, so go out there and do it. So thank you very much. Um, that's it, I'm good. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Now, we don't have any time for questions right now, but if you do have any questions, hop on over to the chat room over at JSConf.Asia or go see Brian during the breaks. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Thanks a lot.